or one. So introduction to archaeological dating techniques. Now, don't do what I've done today, putting in um, um, dating, um, how to find dating techniques or do weird things. You go to all sorts of dating websites. <laughs> but what I would like to do today is, is, is make this a great stab at um, in introducing these dating techniques that I talk about every single week. Now, the dating techniques that I talk about every single week, um, I might mention radiocarbon dating more than once. Um, and radiocarbon dating um, underlying uh, is, is a dating technique used especially for organic materials. That's really important. Dendrochronology is, is the most simplest dating technique um, of all the dating techniques we're going to look tonight. That's why we're going to leave the easiest to the end. I'm scaring you now. Um, but dendrochronology is, is naturally for one, one living thing altogether, um, and that's dating timber uh, from trees. Um, and the wonderful thing about dendrochronology, it, it helps you work alongside radiocarbon dating. Um, there's something I'm going to mention with radiocarbon dating um, is that occasionally the dates for radiocarbon dating are slightly thrown. Um, and to deal with that throwing of the dates from radiocarbon dating, you look at dendrochronology. There, there are always going to be tree rings. Every single year, a tree is going to have a ring, right? So by counting those rings, you're able to get um, a dating technique. OK, an absolute dating technique. That's the word absolute. There's relative and there's absolute dating techniques. These are absolute dating techniques. They're scientific. Um, relative is when you look at stratigraphy and we, we'll look at what those images tell us. There's another um, dating technique um, called thermal luminescence dating for dating inorganic materials which works very similar to optical stimulated luminescence, um, which is the one that we're going to focus on. I'm going to leave out the thermal luminescence dating one when we look at pottery in the future. So optical stimulated luminescence is an absolute um, dating um, technique. Um, and, and how that relies, the, the, the technique works that you, you've got, um, say, quartz, um, and quartz is buried in the ground, sand or whatever, um, and the quartz is buried in the ground, um, and it, it, it's charged um, with um, various um, um, atomic atoms, and it's, it builds, for, ta for example, potassium feldspars, it all sort of builds up, um, and then when, when the quartz is next exposed to the sun, um, all of that sort of exused into the atmosphere and you need to measure what's coming off it. But we'll have a little look at that and see if we can make sense of it. And then we've got another one, which I've only just come across today, which will be, um, which will be of, of importance to um, the likes of Ellen, because um, the technique is known as electron spin resonance, electron spin resonance, which is used um, in dating teeth particularly in dating teeth. This is not strontium. That's another dating technique. We're just going to look at strontium. We're going to look at phosphate analysis. That's another one. Um, and we're going to look at potassium argon dating, which, which if we would have done, if we'd have looked at this one a few weeks ago, um, I've mentioned potassium argon dating when we're looking at old bones like Peking man and so on, and Aboriginal bones. And, and there's one thing about all these dating techniques is... Um, Dendrochronology is very much useful to um, date layers in archaeology. Dendrochronology is useful, uh, um, particularly probably over la the last um, um, 6,000 years when we've got chronologies of timber. But beyond that point, timber itself has decayed or rotted away and so on. So it gets less accurate. Radiocarbon dating is accurate for about 50,000 years to date archaeological sites. Um, optical stimu stimulated luminescence is, is, is really useful for a long period of time. 
Um, and potassium argon dating is when you get beyond the usefulness of all the other dating techniques. Um, you can use potassium argon dating to date really, really old things. Um, and and what I don't want, what I'm not going to do today is relative dating techniques. But what we need to what we need to do is understand um, through looking at these images what relative and absolute dating actually means, which would be very useful. If we don't get through all this tonight, thank God for that. We'll just do um, dendrochronology next week. So uh, relative relative dating uh, rather than absolute dating. Now relative dating um, that word the Harris matrix which um, Mena uh, mentioned months ago to me. So when you look at layers of strata, when you think about layers of strata, it's the law of supposition. The layer that is being deposited on top of another layer is usually later. In geological terms, that's not exactly true because in geology, um, uh, the geological beds can be turned from horizontal to vertical. So that in lots of ways, stratigraphic dating with geology doesn't really work, but in archaeology it does. But not always, not always, um, because um, if if those layers below open up because they, they've been cut into by a post hole or a well or something else like that, things can get contaminated. But the law of supposition is that, is that the layer on top is newer than the layer below. I know that sounds obvious. Um, and the law of supposition and looking at layers is that, for example, um, you, you're not going to get fired pottery um, in a layer that's from the Paleolithic period from 12,000 years ago. Um, you're not going to get fired pottery 12,000 years ago. Probably argue that you can, but, but properly fired in a kiln at about six, 700 degrees C. That's what I'm talking about, right? So in other words, um, if you've got simple tools um, below, that, that, that means that they're earlier than the layers above that are pot shirts. So this is what this is saying. Um, and it's, it's sort of that sense of, um, it mentions here the principle of relative dating. Um, here we go quickly, because um, it's meant to do absolute dating. The artifact, um, the artifacts of a given time and place have a distinctive style. So like goes with like. But um, the next bit of that is, is that you get a simple bit of pottery um, and then it gets more complicated. So with pottery, for example, um, a pottery with just um, um, without really a rim um, and then the rim starts to um, develop and then you've got a handle and that's relative dating. The more complicated an object is in theory, the newer it is in time. Right. That's it in theory. Um, and um, this thing, this thing about carbon dating, everyone loves it because it, it's the thing that um, I've heard. I've heard about radiocarbon dating from from when I was a child. In fact, when I was a child, there was only two dating techniques. There was there was um, dendrochronology, um, and then was radiocarbon dating, carbon dating, carbon C fourteen and C twelve. Um, and um, again. I really want to achieve to try and make this as simple as possible. Um, carbon, I've mentioned radiocarbon dating a lot today in my lecture. I mentioned that the charcoal, the carbon associated with charcoal is, is to be found to be something that you can actually date. And, you know, it would have been great to do dendrochronology today, um, but we'll do a little bit at the end. Um, and when you think about uh, dendrochronology, which is an absolute dating method rather than um, a relative dating method, um, it, it's the earliest form of absolute dating. So we started to look at timbers from Pablo Benito, a lecture I've done very recently. Um, we, we looked at um, Mesa Verde, the Jacob Canyon, and, and the timbers there have been dated to tell us precisely when certain buildings were abandoned. That's how accurate dendrochronology is. That's how useful it is. Um, so this sort of quick overview of what I've already said. So dating methods provide either absolute dates or relative dates on an absolute load of nonsense. Um, so um, straight, um, strangely enough, if you want to 
keep this really simple. Um, absolute dating um, could be a coin, for example. A coin is produced at a certain time and there's a date on it. Um, and that was probably produced a year before. So that's that's fairly absolute. You know, you can't argue with a coin, you know. Um, they, they usually produced, I, or, or that year, particularly coins that were produced in reigns of emperors, they were issued straight away. Unlike today, uh, you go to the Royal Mint, they, they produce coins um, ready for next year because they've got to make millions of them. But it's only a difference of a few months. So that can be an absolute dating um, method. And also, for example, a diary. You know, I've got a diary in front of me and you can probably think that, well, it's diary that says 2020. Um, that I've actually written it, written in it in 2020. So that's fairly absolute dating. Um, and uh, so other other ways of other way documents are really useful. We, we've looked at documents recently. Documents documents are always said not to lie, but they they're, they're very useful um, because documents with dates on, say for example, the Parliament of Machantleth or uh, um, or Aberystwyth for Owen Glyndwr, 1404. Well, that's there, there was we only had parliaments in 1404 and 1405 for an independent Cymru, so they're quite precise absolute dates as well. So there are other forms of absolute dating. Um, to get relative is just to rough up dates. You know, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that. Um, um, oh no, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna guess that Richard is um, 65. So there you go. That's that's a form of relative dating. And I'm not gonna even ask Richard. I know you. I know you're 66. So um, absolute dating, um, a more precise and accurate system is known as ac absolute dating and can in most circumstances provide a calendar year to the object or within a few years. To be honest with you, um, absolute dating, when you're looking at, say, for example, the Roman period and it says you get a radiocarbon date and it says, well, you know, it, it's, it, it's probably 250 years AD or because of a bit of contamination, it could be 260 years AD, right? That's bloody great. That, that's, that's as absolute as you're going to get. Um, the problem is with all the other absolute dating, right, other than the coin and other than the document and other than dendrochronology, all this needs to be done in a laboratory. Um, and, 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 and a laboratory that's specific so I've got a friend in Australia. She's got, she's in a laboratory, and she 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 looks at particularly um, optical stimulated luminescence and electronic spin re uh, resonance. But you have to go to a laboratory to radio radiocarbon date because it's really specific science. Um, and there again, relative dating presupposing that um, there's a sequence and the law of supposition. So. Um, Oh, God, here we go. This is really testing my brain a bit. So um, optical stimulated luminescence. And, uh, and I, I probably make this, um, I try to make this easier than it is. Um, but you've got, you've got the chart in front of you. So if I, if I read from my notes, so I'm going to chuck a few things at, at you guys, and I'm going to see if any of this sticks as the best way of doing this. So um, simply put... Um, optical stimulated luminescence dating, OSL, um, is, is based on understanding sediments. Um, and and the, one, the easiest way of explaining optical stimulated luminescence, racking my brain today, is by looking at glacial um, you know, sediments in, in glaciers, for example. Um, and simply put, OSL, optical stimulated luminescence signals, are reset by exposure to sunlight. So, um, so in other words, an object that's sealed in the ground for a long period of time um, builds up a level of natural radioactivity. Simply placed, the longer it's been in the ground, the more radioactive that thing is, right? G gravel, sand, um, you know, quartz. Quartz can be very radioactive. Felspar, again, can be radio very radioactive. Keep it to sort of minerals that we're aware of. And you find a lot of felspar and quartz in sand 
related residue and you see this in regards to um, glaciation so so what happens is that as that's sealed for a long period of time as soon as it's exposed to sunlight um, all that radioactivity is is exited into the atmosphere it is just tossed into the atmosphere um, so what you've got to do, you've got to take a sample, you've got to seal it, you've got to take it to a laboratory and you've got to see how much radioactivity is released. And the more radioactivity that's released, the older that sample is. And, and I, I can't be any more clearer than that. Um, once the sand grain has been reburied and it is no longer exposed to sunlight, the um, optical stimulated luminescence signal starts to accumulate. It's as simple as that. And, 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 I'm, and hopefully um, that means it's as simple as I don't read, need to read anything more in front of me. And, um, and basically, um, if, if you want a more of a bit, a bit of a scientific uh, bent to this, so if we sort of, um, if, if we want to get a bit more scientific, in, in physics, optical stimulated luminescence is a method for measuring doses from ionizing radiation. The method makes use of electrons trapped um, basically um, within the crystalline structure of the object. So it's trapped. It builds up in the crystalline um, um, structure of the object. So in, in quartz, there's lots of faults and cracks and fells by lots of um, faults and cracks. And I, and I can imagine, it doesn't say it in front of me, I can imagine um, that you're not going to use this technique for a diamond, for example, because a diamond, an unflawed diamond, because you're not going to see those cracks, you're not going to see um, that um, radioactivity build up and so on. So it's probably not going to be useful for that. Um, so the new dating techni technology, so this, co this is coming in in the 80s, but nobody really hears about it because it, it's, it's a new wave wave of things and it, it's a new concept so estimates the time since quartz sediment was exposed to light so when i'm reading about the uffington horse when we when we read about the uffington horse you can probably really get a grip in understanding this date, dating technique when we look at the sediments at the uffington horse. i'm hoping this will work so read this out. The ionizing radiation in the earth excites electrons that become trapped in defects in the crystal lattice of quartz grain. So in other words, um, quartz itself, the little cracks in the quartz itself, that's where it builds up. When these grains are exposed to external stimulus, so in other words, that external stimulus is light. It's the sun. It's laboratory light. Uh, the trapped electrons are released and can be measured. So whatever explodes out there is measured. And the more, um, the, the more that comes off this object, the older it is. It's as simple as that. God. So we're, we're looking at Uffington Horse, and we're not going to do strontium a minute. So we're looking at Uffington Horse. Um, and one thing about... One thing about uh, one thing about the Uffington horse, right, is it's been argued over and over again. What the bloody hell is it? When does it date from? Did it date from four hundred years ago? Did it? Did, did the Romans create it? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it a horse? What the hell is it? Well, we're not interested, and we want to know when it's dated from, right? So the overall school of thought is there's actually a horse, right? We think it's a horse, right? So then they thought, right, all right, then. OK, if it's a horse, right, when does it date to? Now, this this is this is really, really important. So to maybe understand the dating, what we're going to do, um, um, we're going to we're going to take a little bit of a sample from here. If you can see the cursor. Yeah. And this is this is what we make of the dating of the Uffington horse. Um, Though on the Berkshire Downs, the white horse has been in Oxfordshire since county boundary alterations in 1970. The Uffington horse, don't need to see a map where the Uffington horse is. When you're coming from London, when you're coming from Reading, and it just announced, uh, we will be coming into Swindon in 10 minutes. <coughs> if you look on the left there, at the Downs, out of the window, you can see the Uffington horse. That's where it is. Um, with its elegant lines of white chalk, bedrock, the horse is thought to be the oldest hill figure in Britain. A 
there was no evidence up until the 1990s for the date. You know, some people think it was was a dragon, but again, I want to know the date. Until 1995, the Uffington White Horse has thought to date from the Iron Age. So, you know, it's, it's 2,000 years old. Only 2,000 years old. Bloody old, isn't it? One thing I would say about the, the horse figures on the downs across that landscape, Wiltshire, um, Berkshire and whatever, um, there, there's about 20 of them all together. None of them are as old as this, um, except... Um, that there's one that comes very close, but um, this one is is the old one. But how old is it? God, spit it out. So what they what they simply did um, a new technique called optical stimulated luminescence dating by the late nineties. It's a new technique in 1984, but it's not really been tried out. People don't have the technology yet. This technique can show how long soil has been hidden from sunlight. That's exactly what they're doing. Um, as the lines of the horse consist of chalk filled trenches dug in the hillside, and this is what the Uffington horse is. It's a trench filled with chalk. That's all it is. Lovely, I, I love it, but I'm trying to make it simple. And it's been possible to apply OSL, opti optical stimulated luminescence dating, um, testing to the soil between the lower la lowest layer of that chalk um, this revealed the horse to be some 3,000 years old, dating it back into the late Bronze Age. So in other words, what we're talking about, it, it is as easy as this. When you've got, what you need to do, you need to have, um, you need to core directly to the, the bottom depth um, of, of where, you know, basically uh, the Uffington horse is scoured out, right? So they take the top bit of the, the chalk out and they, they they put it in again the scour it every seven years they used to do that was used to be the tradition it's now done by the national trust um and um what what they what they would what they started to do was to um auger into um the ground um and take those samples out take it to a laboratory see the lowest level um expose that lowest level um with some stimulation stimulate it with light and then um, the light, the the um, the radioactive atoms exploded out of it, and by working out the explosion of those radioactive atoms, because they've been stimulated, exposed to light, you can understand the date of that layer when that trench was dug. The, unfortunately, um, when that trench was dug, um, it may have actually have been dug through earlier layers, right? So the, the Uffington horse might actually be older than this technique tells us. Because um, if you think about it with erosion, um, over time, they're gonna, they're gonna dig deeper and deeper ditches. So that layer um, has been dug through, so that layer has been destroyed and they dig deeper. So it might actually, the Uffington horse might actually be much older than 3000 years old, but um, that's the layer that they've actually dated. That's the, that's the last available day uh, layer that they're able to date um so it's great we know it's at least three thousand years old that that layer tells us that this is this is at least three thousand years old so this is how we can really understand the um the uffington horse and on a little note little side note for a couple of you um the horse design opponent has been seen um on throughout um this world of ours in Britain, um, on coins, um, on sort of designs, uh, uh, bronze designs, iron designs, and so on. So the, so the horse design, and then you come into the Mary Lloyd and all the rest of it, but that's going on to another subject altogether. Um, so the next one I want us to do, um, I, I, I do believe that that was that was quite straightforward for me as well. That the problem is when you're um, when you've got a scientific area like this, it's so easy to just make a tiny mistake and you lose everybody um, and you lose yourself as well, which, which isn't good. So um, I wanted to keep strontium really basic. Um, strontium knows where you've been. So when you travel from one area to another, um, the, 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 um, the, the strontium, the radioactive strontium itself, that's what it is. It's on, a, it's on, the, um, it's on the table. It's on a periodic table. That's what strontium is. Um, 
And basically there's strontium in everything, everything that's associated with water and rock, strontium. Uh, water comes from the rock. So the beds in the rock, you can't get away with it. There's strontium in the sea, there's strontium everywhere. Um, so it, it's a good, it, it, strontium analysis um, is a wonderful technique to understand where somebody has lived over a period of their life, particularly the early years of their life and where they've traveled. And if they've traveled anywhere, they've taken their pottery from here to there and all these wonderful things start to come into it. SR, that's the um, strontium periodic number, SR. Strontium, yeah, anything you eat, anything that's, that, that's well, yeah, I've just already said it. it you, strontium builds up associated with your teeth in particular and your bone structure. And that's basically what strontium looks like, SR38. So um, I've, got a, I've got a nice little article I just want to I, I um, look at now. Um, and hopefully, here we go, strontium in bones. Um, strontium is a chemical element that builds up in the bones and tooth enamel. And food, um, and it, it builds up um, onto... Um, the, the tooth and enamel as food is digested. Um, through its precise determination, researchers are now able to distinguish um, between friend and foe on a battlefield. So, you know, uh, this, this, is, this is really impressive. Um, and, you know, it, it helps rewrite archeology span in a way. I've mentioned I've mentioned I've mentioned this next thing a, a, a number of times. I, I've said about the Roman villa at Lantwit Major, um, and I basically said that there are two sets of well, three sets of bodies at Lantwit Major, but two that are, are relevant to us today. Um, and in the um, 18, 1886, 1887, John Story, the archaeologist, found over 30, 30 human remains in a room, all beheaded and a horse. Um, and he basically said, these, these people are the people that lived at this site. They, they're, they're all male and they lived at this site. And, you know, um, that's proof that the women were taken away. And we had these raids sometime about 350, you know, and all the, all the women and children were taken away turned out to be completely wrong because the strontium values associated with the teeth tell us that the people did not come from the local area they had traveled to this local area um probably by sea um up north um and basically those people that had been found dead in that room at Lantwit major um uh, were not the owners of the site the owners of the site had butchered the invaders and in a moment History is rewritten. So to be able to understand friend and foe on a battle on an ancient battlefield, this is possible because in nature, strontium SR occur, occurs in a variety of forms, isotopes, that differ according to the number of particles in the atomic nucleus. So in other words, what we're talking about there is that strontium is derived from rock, and each, uh, each rock that it derives from has a slightly different signature it has a lower or um, a lower or higher value um, by recording the lower and higher values associated with your teeth say the value remains the same uh, while you must have lived in Barry all your life like me and Richard um, but say for example the strontium val uh, value um, is one value and then you move to my steg um, and then you move to Swansea, um, and then you move to Scotland. Um, and th this is all associated with your early years between about 1 and 14, somewhere like that, where the strontium value um, is recorded in relation um, to the enamel um, and um, construction of your teeth. Um, this, this, the, these isotopes are, are readable, and you, can, you, you know where you've been. You know where you've lived in your early years. Um, so... This is all associated with geological conditions. As we know, across Britain, you've got um, um, sedimentary, you've got uh, metamorphic, you've got igneous rock. All this is associated with the strontium values. Um, and obviously, water pushes through these rocks. And, and obviously, there's this um, radioactive element, strontium, available to be recorded. As the strontium in the bones is constantly exchanged um, um, uh, with 
um, the strontium ingested with food, the, the isotope ratio in bone material reflects that in the surrounding area. So in other words, where you've lived is reflected in your teeth and your bones, in particular your teeth. Um, so let's sort of look at a couple more images. I'm hopefully I'm winning on this one. Does that sound okay? Did you follow that one, Richard? Yeah, yeah. You're just bloody saying it. I, yeah. I know. <laughs> I know that one was a. Um, you see, it gets difficult from then onwards. Um, so this is this is a nice little chart and probably telling you about the strong strontium values. Um, and I'm just gonna um, check something a minute. I think that's okay. So in other words, um, whatever we eat, whatever we drink whether you're a herbivore um, or you're a carnivore, um, you're indigesting that and it, it's um, associated with the teeth and your bone structure. Um, and, and all those strontium values, granite, uh, basalt, limestone, sandstone, all, all those types of rock have a certain signature. Um, and that's very much into your bone structure. And it's a really helpful technique now. We're back to the earlier thing that um, it said about um, identifying friend from throw on a battlefield. It's really interesting because usually um, people, usually there's two sides, two sides go to war, right? So there's those from England or there's those from Scotland and they go to England or the English go to Wales and defending in Wales, there, there might be the Welsh, but um, you're also gonna get different signatures in association with people who are helping the Welsh, for example, at the time of O'England Dour. Um, and they're gonna have different strontium values associated with France. You can tell where that person originated from, which is very, very important. Um, and if you're trying to, you know, if you're looking at a, a graveyard um, and you want to, um, or moreover, if you're looking at somewhere like Stonehenge, and you've got bones at Stonehenge. It's rather useful to work out where the bone, where those people are actually coming from. And not only is this strontium useful in understanding human beings and where they come from, it's also useful for animals as well, because animals um, eat and drink. So that's what strontium looks like. There is, there's our little strontium. Um, SR38 strontium on the periodic table. And suddenly, we've moved on to another one. And I have mentioned this one, but we're gonna be very, very brief with it. Um, this is potassium argon dating. Mentioned it with my lectures about really old um, um, sort of primates and um, really old prehistoric man. So, um, so that's basically um, the um, symbol for argon. We're looking at potassium argon dating. Um, like radiocarbon dating relies on measuring radioactive emissions. Um, and when we want to look at really old things that cannot be classed as organic, that have been lithified or fossilized, we need to look at um, the um, radioactive element um, um, associated with the periodic table, potassium argon. Um, and potassium argon um, is very much associated with volcanic materials. And lots of our human ancestors are associated with volcanic materials. When, when we look at the Olduvai Gorge and we look at dating um, for um, bodies at the old Olduvai Gorge. Um, lots of them are associated with um, volcanic materials and with that volcanic materials associated with our um, human ancestors, um, they've, got, they've got a certain level of potassium and argon and that decays not over 50,000 years, um, say in relation um, um, to the likes of radiocarbon dating, um, actually, radiocarbon dating has a, a certain signature, but radiocarbon dating is only useful, useful for the past 50,000 years and not after that. So you've got to look at potassium argon dating. And actually, the footprints, the toli footprints that I've mentioned in the Olduvai Gorge, the Rift Valley, um, Tanzania, 
um, our human ancestors were walking across um, um, volcanic um, tufa um, that was actually setting. It was still really hot and people walked across that and their footprints were preserved. So then those footprints were preserved and another layer formed over that. But by identifying um, when those um, footprints were formed is possible. And we've got roundabout dates for when those footprints were created. But um, that was um, when they were originally dated, they were looking at layers across the landscape. Um, and that was in the 1950s, 1960s. But now we're able to give a more a precise date to these footprints uh, associated with uh, Litoli, um, associated with the Olduvai Gorge. Um, and actually, another you can they're actually starting to use potassium argon dating um, in regards to Pompeii, uh, because again that's associated with the volcanic material. So that's that. I wasn't supposed to spend as long on that one. Um, and um, this is this is basically um, potassium argon. And I thought, right, I'm not going to go into the science. I was going to, but no. Um, so the technique known as potassium argon dating is used to date volcanic rock and ash and thus establish dates for nearby fossils um, like this hominid skull. Um, so the, the thing we need to do is try to um, make a little bit more sense of a technique that I'm sure we're all aware of. It's the technique known as radiocarbon dating. Now, radiocarbon dating has been around since 1949, 1950. Um, so radiocarbon dates are presented um, to us by Willard Libby from 1949, 1950. Um, and radiocarbon dates um, can be really useful um but they're not the most accurate of dating methods but they are they are pretty good in other words what we say we got a best estimate when looking at radiocarbon dates um and and radiocarbon radiocarbon works um, and we'll look at this um, um an object that's animate wandering around as a certain level of radiocarbon in their bone structure right, in their organic structure. We, it's all the same, right, it's all the same level um, in their organic um, structure. Um, but as soon as that thing dies, the radiocarbon starts to decay, right, starts to deteriorate. So, um, so a nice little chart there. So again, what is radiocarbon dating? Carbon-14 uh, dating is a laboratory analysis that provides objective age estimates for carbon-based materials that originated from living organisms, such as archeological finds, um, but it cannot be used for objects beyond about 50 to 60,000 years ago, because basically the radiocarbon has gone from the atmosphere. Um, um, has gone, um, has, has decayed so much that, that any radiocarbon in the atmosphere back 60,000 years ago has long since decayed, has long since disappeared. It will decay without being exposed, exposed to the sun. It will naturally decay over time. So it's an unstable element, in other words, radiocarbon. Um, so I think what we'll do, there's obviously getting a radiocarbon date from that. Um, what when you when you need to get radiocarbon dates, um, the way to do it is when you're excavating is take a sample straight away um, because you want it you don't want to get it contaminated by any organic matter you know um, nail clippings hair um, or things like that. So here we go, nice little table in front of us. Um, I'm, I'm hopefully not losing you yet. Um, I'm not losing me yet either. Not to sound patronising. Um, how to collect samples to get the best radiocarbon dates, bone and teeth. Um, 
So you've got to collect um, good fragments of bone. Um, and since these bone fragments preserve well, so what you need to do is you've got to get gloves, you've got to take a sample, hopefully it's not been contaminated. The larger bones include femurs, tibias, upper arm bone, skull, plate and jaw bone. For human teeth, preferred samples a singular complete incisors or canines. So in, in, in other words, a canine that's um, not damaged, um, um, it, it's completely sealed. Um, if sending a molar, all four roots must be attached. So again, um, teeth and bone, animal, um, you can use this radiocarbon dating technique on. So the next one is charcoal. To separate charcoal from sediment, um, you need to use tweezers. Um, for large pieces of charcoal that are not covered in a lot of clay, you can use uh, water flotation. So whenever Margaret's been washing, I always say, you know, if we can keep some of the charcoal, just in case we might be able to get samples. Dry charcoal samples, um, you, you need to sort of dry them out, uncontaminated, that's what you need to do. Wood. Um, um, wood itself, you can get um, radial carbon off, um, but it needs to be really good samples of wood to get radio, um, radio carbon uh, dating samples off in the first place. Um, there was something else. Yeah, that, that's the other thing I wanted to look at in a second. So we got what we've got. We, hang on, just double checking. Oh, another technique. So making this making this as easy as pie, um, as, as, as easy as, as I possibly can. So if, if you you've got an archaeologist and he's excavating, right? So if you look at this, um, the, the corn plant absorb, absorbs carbon during photosynthesis. So the corn plant absorbs carbon during photosynthesis. It's locked into the leaves. It's locked into the roots. It's locked into the tuber of the plant. It's there. Um, and then as soon as a bit breaks off, the radial carbon starts to decay, right? Or it's eaten by the little turkey on the right. So the turkey consumes the, the um, consumes the carbon when it eats the corn. So it eats the corn, it consumes the carbon that locked into that organic object that was alive. The carbon is absorbed into all its tissues, including its bones. Yes, good. Carbon 14, carbon 12 is, a, is, is in the bone structure. The turkey is butchered. The turkey is now dead. So the sequence of the decay of the radiocarbon starts again. Um, and one of its um, leg bones is fashioned into a bone awl. Uh, basically, an awl is, is a little thing to make holes. As soon as the turkey dies, the carbon is absorbed during its lifetime, begins to decay at a known rate, releasing radiocarbon uh, 14 from all its tissues, including the bone awl. Now, do you want me to make things as simple as possible for radiocarbon? Um, radio, radiocarbon... Um, has a half-life of 5,730 years. So basically, um, the radiocarbon decays at 5,730 years, right? Um, it decays at a half-life. So, so basically, um, if that turkey was butchered um, 5,730 years ago, this is where I either screw up or I get it right. The turkey is butchered 5,730 years ago. And if precisely half of the um, radial carbon is still there um, in the sample of bone, right? Precisely half of the radial carbon is still in that bone that precisely dates that bone um, as coming from an animal that lived 5,730 um, years ago. Now, um, Richard, did that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Good. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make that, I'm going to run that through again. So in other words, the turkey lived 5,730 years ago. The bone is excavated. It goes into a laboratory and the archaeologists work out precisely there's half the original radiocarbon 14 atoms left in the bone, giving it a date of 5,730 years ago. And obviously you can use calculations like that. So um, if, if there's no radiocarbon, um, and, and then, then there's a half-life and there's a half-life again, and then it goes down to basically nothing. So this is the way it works. So you've got to send this to the laboratory. So the archaeologists find a turkey bone all during excavation. Radiocarbon laboratory measures how much C14 is left in the bone all to determine when the turkey died. Excellent. That gives you a date when the bone all was actually carved uh, and, and then used, giving you an idea of the, the, the date of the layer in the archaeological site. Job done. Those people are living um, in relation to the turkey 5,730 years ago. Job done. Um, Bob's a winner. Right. Now, um, here's another little one. Um, it, it, it's one that I've known about for some, some time, and we'll just sort of do this break briefly. Um, it's known as phosphate analysis. Um, phos we'll, we'll, we'll keep this rudimentary as possible, and I've got to keep it rudimentary, otherwise I'm not going to understand it, to be honest. Phosphate in man-made soils derives from people, their animals, rubbish and bones. Um, a hundred people excrete about 62 kilograms of phosphate annually, um, with about the same from their rubbish. Their animals excrete even more. A human body contains um, 650 grams of um, phosphates, apparently, uh, which results in elevated levels in burial sites. So there's phosphates associated with bones, human waste, and so on. Um, and what happens with those phosphates? Um, they are fixed into the soil. They are, they are stored into the soil for thousands of years. Um, and I'm going to stop that there, actually. That's enough for me. So you can work out where animals and humans have been by the levels of, by recording the phosphate signature. So if there's a high phosphate signature in the ground, I'm going to chuck it in there quickly. It's either because a load of cows have been excreting there for a very, very long time, or underneath the surface, there's storage pits full of loads of crap, human crap, right? And basically you can record you don't need to excavate to work out where humans and animals have been. By recording levels of phosphates, you need to sample the soil and think, right, my God, you know, and by, by the different concentrations and the signatures, you can work out whether it's a, um, a pile of shit from a load of cows or um, it's evidence of an archaeological site. And, and that's how the phosphates work, phosphate analysis. So we're looking at this, this nice little table in front of us. Um, of an archaeological site and and what you could do is quite easy you auger through that site an auger um, a, a long a long pole um, and you auger a, a hollow pole and you auger into that site and you, and you or you could screw it into the uh, ground you can different types of augering um, instruments you could auger directly into there um, and you could bring that auger out and you can read the phosphate levels to work out um, whether people lived at that site um, in, in that layer or whether they didn't or the site was abandoned or they lived in that layer or whether they had certain animals or whether they just had cattle uh, roaming across the landscape. It's a wonderful technique, but, but they don't make enough of it in archaeology. When I, this phosphate analysis, I've known about it for years, but we don't usually use it in archaeology, which is, which is a big shame, really. So... Um, this this next one, um, and I do believe that this is um, this is the last one. <laughs> Thank God for that. Then we do a bit of dendrochronology, and we're okay. We're we're out of this, right? Um, there's a new technique which has come on the market. Well, when I say new, it's only been around for a few years. Um, again, I know somebody in a laboratory in Australia, and and she's got 
one of these machines. Um, she's doing a PhD and she's got one of these machines. She's got an electron spin resonance machine. So this is another technique, electron spin resonance dating, which, which is used specifically for teeth, right? So, you, so basically she cuts through teeth, right? Um, so the electron spin resonance ESR measures the number of trapped electrons accumulated in teeth. So this is very different from strontium, but it relies upon teeth. Um, um, and so basically, um, they're not a set of healthy teeth, are they, Ellen? But measured the number of trapped electrons accumulated since the time of burial um, in the floors of the dental and enamel's crystalline structure. At sites containing human and animal teeth, ESR can be used to determine how long the teeth have been in the ground. So brilliant. But finding teeth at archaeological sites is un unusually flawed. You know, it's very difficult to find the teeth, a tuft just tossed over there. Do you know what I mean? In a layer, it's going to be there for a reason. So this dating tech uh, method is not as common as, uh, as um, uh, optical thermal luminescence dating or radiocarbon dating. But, drum roll, when they were looking at um, Homo florensis, the hobbit figure on the island of florensis, um, they had more teeth than they had bones at times, and they they could find out because of the buildup of electrons associated with the teeth um, built up in the crystalline structure of, of the enamel. They could work out around when these teeth um, were deposited in the ground, i.e., when the person died. So that's that's that dating technique. Oh, that was probably the easiest one. Um, so obviously teeth. Um, this new dating technique, um, obviously the teeth need to be in layers that have, haven't been opened and contaminated for some time. Um, and there's our, there's more of our teeth. I, I'm sure that um, Ellen could give a whole lecture on these teeth, um, but it's not exactly dating. So the last one I want us to sort of look at sort of briefly um, is this, is, is, is dendrochronology. And I, and I keep mentioning it, and we'll we'll have a good old stab at um, dendrochronology next week. So we'll all be aware of tree rings. And actually, um, I've got to be careful what I say now. You don't need to be a scientist and have a laboratory to read tree rings. But what you do need is the same wood to do tree ring dating. So in other words, uh, if, if you're in a certain area and there's um, a penduncular oak, um, an English oak tree growing, um, and and you've got a timber in a building that is nearby um, and it's got tree rings, by taking a core from the living tree and you compare it with the timber in now the dead tree in the house, by, by co-matching some of the rings with the living tree, you can build up a chronology. This is how dendrochronology works, tree ring dating. So this is probably the only accessible scientific method that we could probably, if we've got rudimentary equipment, when I say, you know, we got equipment that we can rely upon, um, we, we can all sort of give this sort of uh, tree ring uh, dating a go, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't drill into um, any oak tree anytime soon um know what you're doing first so dendrochronology tree ring data and the scientific method of dating um tree rings uh, to the exact year they were formed because tree basically seasonal you, you you can get an idea of when it's growing the plith um, and so on as well as dating them uh, this can um give a uh, data um for climate as well um so it's not just a a, a dating technique it's it's um a climatological uh, benchmark. So obviously, say there was an absolute crap year and there was little rain, um, then, the, then the rings on a tree are going to be really slight. If there's a lot of rain and, and you know, it's, it's quite temperate and so on, then the rings are going to be quite wide. Um, um, the study of climate and at atmospheric conditions during different periods in history from wood, and ov but obviously dendrochronology is going to work when we've got uh, samples. Without, obviously without salt. Um, 
when you look at lots of the other de dating techniques, you take for granted there's quartz around and pottery around and 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 um, bones around and so on, um, and and you've got loads of teeth around and they're basically indestructible really, unless you grind them up or you do something terrible to them, but um, wood itself rots in the ground and um, and gets more unreliable into the um, six, seven, ten thousand years ago. Um, but but it's a, a very significant way of um, dating um, archaeological layers and buildings and timbers. Um, so if we if we sort of if we want to quickly look at this here, um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to close that window. I'm going to bring this on the screen, um, and I'm going to get. I, I want a little bit of annotation here, and we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit of detail next week. And what I'm what I might do is not just do. Um, not just do tree ring dating next week. Try and put a little bit of what I want to do um, for the next eight, a little bit of excavation um, um, and, a, and a little bit of um, um, structural stuff and buildings. Try and do a bit of that next week as well. Um, so if, you, if we're looking at this, you can see that um, these are plentiful years. Um, there's lots of rain. Um, but these are not plentiful years. There must have been some kind of um, drought um, or um, there wasn't enough moisture in the soil. There is, and, and you can actually, um, you can start, start to sort of get this sort of sense. Um, and then what's probably happening is these tree rings are really, really narrow as it gets to the end. So there's obviously less moisture. Um, the land is being drained and this tree is not having a healthy life as it used to, um, and, you know, think things were a lot different for this tree at one time. Look at those tree rings; they're they're, they're really really wide. Um, things get bad, um, and and things start to get worse and worse. So this is what you can probably see from these tree rings. Um, so what I'm going to do is clear that, and I think we got one more image, and that'll be it, really. Um, and one word of warning when you're looking at tree rings there are certain species that are useful in understanding tree ring um now a pine tree is going to be no good for reading tree rings uh, but oak elm ash yews a good one that's a good one but you don't usually see you being used in in um as structural timbers in 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 many cases you do see you do see oak and ash and, and um, elm being used. Um, and that's where you're gonna really look for um, tree rings. And also, I think the final point um, is that really old oak is indestructible. Um, and what do I mean by that? Is that if you've got an oak beam that's 500 years old in a building um, and you put a candle underneath it, it just will not burn. And, it, and we know that because some old houses, you see the servants used to live in the attic. Um, and what they used to do, they used to, they used to suspend a candle from underneath an old oak beam. Um, and even though it sort of slightly darkens and might char it, it will not set a light. Um, but I wouldn't try it in any old house. It um, doesn't always go that way. So what I would like to do, right, um, I'm going to ask a dangerous um, question of Margaret, right? Now I'm going to, I don't want to ask this question, right? Margaret, have I succeeded in what I aim to do today or have I completely failed? Are you happy? I understood all of it. <laughs> oh, you understood all of it? Yes. All right then. Well, that's it then. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to ask if, if anyone struggled with anything. So, Margaret, anything you want to say at this stage whilst you're on still? Um, no, not, not really. Apart from the phosphate analysis, that's in the lab as well, is it, I assume? Yes, it is. It is. Um, yeah. it, I, 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 I like phosphate analysis, but unfortunately I don't hear about it used as much as I used to uh, because I think... Um, I think they may have used it in a time team episode or something. And, um, and, and they said, oh, the phosphates here are really, you know, there's loads of phosphates in the ground. It means that there's a building underneath. And then a farmer come along and said, that's where I keep my, that's where all my shit is piled up. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so the problem is the problem is they've had to hone in. It's it's like all these techniques. Radiocarbon dating has be they they've actually managed to push radiocarbon dating and the the optimum window of radiocarbon carbon dating back another fifteen thousand years. Um, that half life structure and all the rest of it. But we're still into the potassium argon dating for bones older. And one thing I failed. I think I got a bit excited as I do. Um, I didn't mention the difference between um, lithification and um, fossilization. Um, and they're very much in the same word when, when basically the process of lith- lithification is that um, it's basically turning into stone. Um, what happens is the vesicles in a bone um, are replaced with um, minerals and then the bone starts to decay and they're replaced with mis- um, minerals and then you've got the complete process of, of fossilization. But unfortunately, the word fossilization, like the word ancient, is, is used quite a lot. So basically you say, oh, there's fossilized footprints off on the coast at Borth in, in, in Cardiganshire and they date to 6,000 years ago. They're not fossilized at all. They're layers of mud that have hardened. That's not fossilization. And the word ancient, what really gets me is when people say, that's an ancient woodland over there. And you're thinking, well, if you look at a map, right, 200 years ago, there was no trees there. So how can it be ancient? But it's still bloody old. Anyway, sorry, I've gone off on tangent. So if that's you done, Margaret, brilliant. What about you, Richard? Ah, oh, it's all, it's all seemed quite straightforward to me. Well, <coughs> it didn't seem it to me when I was explaining it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Bill. Yeah, um, radio carbon dating, Carl. You mentioned that carbon-14 is an unstable isotope while naturally occurring carbon-12. Yes. After something dies, after carbon, carbon-based carbon life form dies, the carbon-14 deteriorates at such a rate that after 5,730 years, the sample contains 50% carbon-14. Yes. But when it comes to accuracy, um, as you pointed out many times, it's the contamination factor at the start of it was important in getting the date right. Now, what factors do you look for in choosing a sample which has no contamination or, minim- or minimum cut contamination? What What is the contamination we're actually talking about here? Um, but but, base, but the, the first thing is house rules, right? One thing we've learned is is face masks and um, um, uh, gloves. Um, but ba- ba- basically, um, I remember I was working on um, on an archaeological site outside um, Cowbridge years ago, and I wanted to get a perfect sample, but I was very aware that there was leaching into the ground from um, from horse um, feces, so that would that would contaminate the radiocarbon date because that, that that's organic and it's it's going to get into the, the contamination of the ground. Um, what you're probably looking at is is um, the, the best sites to get radiocarbon dates are sites that have been completely abandoned. Because when we did, um, when we looked at the site of Hattusa, um, the, the Hittite kingdom in Turkey, because that site was completely abandoned and, and nobody really lived there after that, then the radiocarbon dates, dating is not going to be contaminated. right? But when you look at something like Monmouth, you've got a Roman site at Monmouth, you've got a fort at Monmouth, but then you've got the medieval site and you've got pits being dug and it's going off on the side and there's all this contamination. It's not really going to work. So you, and, and with and another good place to get radiocarbon dates is actually a cemetery. Because when, yeah. a, when a body's placed into the ground, it's left. It's not meant to be interfered with, and it's not, and, and whatever. And, the, and, and even perfect, if there's a gravestone above it, right, there's going to be le- little leaching, there's going to be little contamination, um, and it's going to be perfect. A, a, a grave would be great. And also, another one as well is, another one is when you get, um, for example, when you're working at a, um, a hearth, when you're working at a hearth, um, usually with halves um, in the past, th- there's a half and then they put another half on top and there's a layer formed and a half and they don't clean that out, half, 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 half. As long as those lay- individual layers are not, not interfered with, you can get good radiocarbon dates from them as well. Okay, so sealed coffins are the best place to get minimum contamination of a sample. Yeah, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't start digging up church graveyards. Well, why not? <laughs> Just um, to prove the <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, I won't, I won't. I've got my spade ready, actually, but I don't want to know. There's a cemetery in Barry. Um, anyway, okay, okay. 
J J but by, mind you, don't park your car outside the cemetery because you'll never see it again. Jessica, anything you'd like to say? No, it was really good. Obviously, I, I, I haven't done anything sort of sciencey in a while, so I was a bit worried, but I felt like I understood a lot of it. Good. Oh, God, I feel totally vindicated. Now, <laughs> what about you, Mena? Anything you'd like to say? Uh, I, I, it was just really good. I, I actually understood a bit more than I did before. Because I, I, I can remember you saying your lecturers did, you couldn't, didn't learn anything from your lecturers, so that's good. No, not quite, but okay. <laughs> um, so that, that's good. Um, and Ellen, um, I know you're going to say lots about teeth, but we haven't got all night. It's your platform. Don't take long. Right, well, at the beginning, you said the slide said that you needed molar teeth with four roots. Upper molar teeth have generally got three. And lower molar teeth have generally got two. Right. It's not, it's not common to have more roots than that. Okay. okay. Um, I, and and I the other thing is, as well, you know, with your um, phosphate um, work, is it, are you able to differentiate between um, natural organic phosphates and yes. those used in fertilizers that have leached into oh, land? Shit. Um, I, I thought you were going to keep that simple. I thought you were going to say differentiate between natural phosphates and, and animal phosphates and human yeah. phosphates. I think that that's doable. But unfortunately, that, that's, that's the problem. That is the problem. Man-made phosphates. Actually, phosphates overall can contaminate radiocarbon dating, can de destroy any evidence from the phosphates you're trying to detect in the ground. Phosphates are not good on archaeological sites. So that's the answer to that one. So you need to know the modern history of the ground as well. Yeah. Take into account before you just go in to do dating, right? Like that time team episode, yeah, it was quite funny actually because um, what happened? Th this is what happened, right? They 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 flew over a landscape and they thought they saw circles on the land, right? They, they thought they were roundhouses, and and then they they got down and sampled on the ground, and they thought there was high levels of phosphates, and they got really excited. And then, then, and then they did a bit of geophys, and there was in some undulations on the landscape, right? They got real. So there was three, three things telling them that they were roundhouses, right? It was great, but then the farmer come along and said that that's where I've always kept my shit, mm -hmm. directly where that building is. So the, the the depression in the ground that was being recorded by the um, by the geophys was Good. actually by the crap. And then the phosphates from the animals that was from the animals and the aerial view, and at that. And, and this is why sometimes you need to know, as as um, Ellen said, what the land, what's been going on on the landscape. And that's one thing that I think Time Team learnt. Um, that there was an idiotic episode where they they had been wandering around for to find a wall. I am a great fan of Time Team, but it's good to see them making mistakes. They were trying to find this medieval wall and an arch, and they they used all the techniques, every single technique you could think of, right? And then the farmer said, "Oh." They went in a pub afterwards and said, oh, we spent the whole program looking for this arch. And they said, I wish you'd have asked me. I could have just taken you there. So it's good to have the local knowledge. And, and it was it was it was it was so cretinous, but it was it was it was wonderful. You cannot take for granted anything in archaeology. And, and, and sometimes you can make these these co blank bammers of, of mistakes um, right um Anne, anything you'd like to say and then pam and i'd like to say something then and that and keep it keep it brief and um, remember I, the checklist no washing yeah. machines no televisions I, I, go for it i presume it's always nice to know the different techniques yes it and is i think if, it, if you were an archaeologist i'm sure you send them to a lab yes so i don't have to worry too much about it but i I, uh, I will go over it again, mm. you know, to mm. let it sink in a bit more, you know. I, I think, I think, Anne, the answer is do some more homework. And actually, um, it, it might be a little bit of an exercise to, um, to see how you would go about um, doing some sampling by yourself, um, dendrochronologically sampling, and what equipment you'd actually need. I'm not saying you go out and do it, but... no. See, see what equipment you might need and see if it's yeah. actually doable. And, and, and that would be a good experiment for you, Anne. That, right. that would be rather useful. And Pam, anything from you, darling? Please, um, I've had experience where I used to live. 15 houses needed to be dated. And this official 
party of people came in today to have. Um, they weren't too satisfied with the wood samples, and I don't know why. Maybe it was because it wasn't, un maybe Elm was more difficult. So what they did, um, they took down part of the scene and we let them do that. And the lot went over into our neighbour's house. Um, unfortunately, when we bought the house, it was all sprayed. And our neighbour's house was sprayed as well. But he had a machine, and I'm taking it, it was OSL. Um, so because he went, and he, he went into the corner of next door neighbour's house because it was all one house at one time, and he found sediment, fungus, things like that, right in the corner. So he came down, he was ecstatic. So, so in other words, because he had found some, that's the point. Because he had found some decent timbers, he was able to get some decent samples and that's basically what you need. And that's what we'll be doing when we're looking at lots of these timbers from those buildings. Thanks, thanks for that, Pam. So what I'm gonna do next week, right? I want to get straight down to the undies, right? I've got to convince Margaret to do another eight, right? So next week, uh, it's sort of worked today. I'm really impressed with that. There's no moans and groans, right? Um, so next week, we're going to do a bit of dendrochronology. Uh, we're going to slap that on the bottom, and then we're going to do a bit of the old um, archaeological excavation, and we're going to do a little bit of um, looking at building timbers and um, that'll tie in with a few other things so that's what we'll do next week um, if nobody else has got anything else to say if anyone wants to say anything say it now one two three no um, is, is it it's richard wearing a new port shirt yes he is um <laughs> and, and as, uh, what, uh, no. I, I, I do believe oh, I'm yeah. not short. <laughs> Mark and Spencer's uh, anyway, who else wanted to say something then? Because I know there was another little voice before we're going to finish. Anybody else? No? Okay, okay then. Um, well, that was really good. I'm glad that worked tonight. I'm, I'm dead dead impressed with myself. Um, oh, that's good. Anyway, very relieved. And So if there's nothing else, I, um, I've said everything that we need to do. Um, if you need to sign up and you are going to sign up, do so. If you're still thinking about it, decide next week. Um, I really enjoyed tonight. You've been a, a great group, a great gang. So I'm going to say good night to Richie, babe, Billis, um, Jess, Mena, Maggie, Annie, Ellen um, from Newport and Pam. So that's it. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Be Thank wary you. of the hedgehogs. Wink, wink, nudge. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. Yeah. Bye. Right. So do you know what? That's a week of teaching over and done with. I, I it's just like yes. And I got I got to spend a whole day on grant applications tomorrow. Oh, nice. Miss. Okay. So uh, by the way, Richard, I, I love yeah. your Newport top. It's great. <laughs> do, you, do you know? I got to tell you this story, right? I was um, I went to a rugby match. No, a football match. It was Wales versus Germany, right? And my mum had brought me this hat with bells on it, right? Um, and it was um, it was yellow, red, and black, right? And it was and it it looked great. It looked really good. So anyway, there's me with a, a Welsh shirt on and a Welsh scarf, and and um, I go into the singing area now um, of the stadium. And everyone around me is is avoiding me like the plague, right? Um, and it only turned out that the colours I was wearing were actually German. <laughs> and we were playing Germany that day and guess what we actually beat Germany 1-0 so that was great so um, it's cool so anyway that's it so um, anything you want to say Pam or, or, are you okay no I'm fine okay I'm, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go now tomorrow um, fine what, what's that Pam have a nice time tomorrow yeah I'm gonna bloody love it I'm, I'm really looking forward to it I'm, I might actually take up smoking drugs <laughs> I'll just uh, keep chewing your pen. Hey, I tell you what, this, this form filling is so repetitive, but oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and um, we had a grant from um, we had a grant in uh, June, and um, we we got the money. That was great. We spent the money on what we meant to spend it for, so that's great. Two tick boxes, and then they said, now you've got to tell us 
why it was such a great grant and and this and tell us why and i just thought oh my god i just don't <laughs> want to do this anyway on that note i'm off so i'll see you yeah. soon guys take care bye Bye-bye. bye 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 bye, bye. bye.